you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back with our own liberal, but uh, we won't hold that against him. It's quite funny, it's a joke between us. I'm sure he uh, appreciates it. Mark Draper, infantryman. In the first episode, he told us a lot of stories, wonderful stories. I really enjoyed it. If you don't, or you haven't seen that episode yet, please go back and just have a look at it. It's worth your while, I promise you. But Mark, thank you and welcome back again. I'm leaving it over to you now because I know you've got a lot of stories you want to tell us. We're listening. Hi, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I want to um, just go back to um, the, the, the last base you were at when I ended off last time was Okotopi. And I've thought of some of the other things that happened there. And um, I think I, it would be nice that the guys can hear this. At Okotopi, there was a dog unit. Um, and uh, they often used to send one one uh, troop with his dog with us when we went on patrol. And um, the one dog they had there was actually a cross wolf. And that dog, you couldn't get near it. We were, we were terrified of that dog. And only his handler could handle him. And he was like putty in the handler's hand. But if anybody else came near that dog, he wanted to eat them up. He didn't like them at all. We also had the Berriera guys there with their horses. And um, they kept to themselves. We didn't really, they used to go out on patrol with their horses quite a bit. And the motorbike guys were there as well. And um, you'd often hear these 500 cc's starting up in the morning and herring off out through the gate, going on some other patrol or something. So it was actually quite an interesting base where they had dogs and horses and motorbikes and stuff like that. Um, then. Also, I forgot to say that when we got to Okotopi, they, we, we, one guy in the uh, platoon was issued with uh, RPG and one guy in the platoon was issued with, um, I forget the size, 40 millimeter or something like that, those little snot horses we used to call them. And um, we all got to shoot with that stuff, uh, practice just so that you knew how it worked. Not, nothing... No real training on it, but we all got, you know, the basic training on it. And um, so why I'm telling that, because I forgot to tell we, as a, the story about where um, the guys had an accident with the RPG. What they did was we were broken up into our two sticks, but, and the RPG went with the other stick. And um, the same guy, funny enough, that got lost in the Caprivi, he had the RPG. And one afternoon late, they were at a, um, these cooker shops and they were sitting outside the cooker shops under the, there was a big marula tree or some tree they were sitting under in the shade. And old Fergie was at his RPG uh, on, its, on its base, that flared piece at the back, it stand there. And he was flicking the little hammer, just, you know, just click, 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 click. And the one guy said to him, Fergie, please don't do that. His words weren't cold when that RPG went off. Eh? It went, um, went off and it just, um, luckily it didn't hit the branches above. It just glanced them and then disappeared off to the side. But those guys, I don't know how many weeks they spent in hospital because of the sand blast from the back blast of that thing. Yes. It was looked like they'd been the guy they had sandpaper rubbed on their faces and they put all the pieces that didn't have cloth on. And that was quite a um, a scary thought. I tell you, when those guys were better, oh Fergie didn't stop running for about a week. That loot chased him. <laughs> that loot chased him until he was finished. Eh? There on the border. I remember because we were still in the old Okotopi base. And they were building the new Okotopi base to the south. And there was a what, um, uh, uh, what would you call it? A, a, a quarry where they dug the sand out, I suppose, to build the walls for the, for the, uh, for the base. 
and they took them into that quarry, boy, and they drilled, uh, and they made them run. And uh, I felt very sorry for the guy afterwards. It wasn't wasn't great. Then, um, as I said before, we worked once or twice with the um, uh, this police, uh, Kufut. And I remember we were on a follow-up and we got to a crawl. And we could actually see the tracks, the, the, the Swapo tracks walking right almost through this crawl. And there was a black sergeant, I think he was, um, with Kufut. And um, he, uh, he then asked the guys, where, where are these people and what, when were they here? And, all, and they just shook their head. They said they have no idea where these guys are. And um, they, they were not interested in telling us at all. And the, the Wolfman, the, 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 um, the main oak in the crop, he had a knopkiri. And um, the guys, uh, the, the sergeant just grabbed this knopkiri and he whacked him just above the eye here. I've got it here today, this knopkiri. It's very short. It's just half a meter, just a little bit longer than half a meter. But it's heavy. You can see it's dark wood. And um, uh, he, uh, he whacked him just above, I just saw blood. And, but that guy didn't stop, stop talking for half an hour after he'd been be whacked. <laughs> and, he, the, um, and as he, as, as he uh, walked away from, um, he threw it up onto our buffle and said, you know, just how he did him. And um, of course, our sergeant was on our buffle as well at that time. And he said, Oh, I don't for me. Keep that thing for me. I want it. Put it in the bin at the back. Way. And me sitting at the back with the, uh, the LMG, um, I opened the bin and I chucked it in the top of the bin. And off we went following this track again. And I think later that afternoon or next, I can't remember, if we spent the night out or what it was. But when we got back to base, and I remember this thing's in the bin all the time, eh? And of course, I take it and I keep it with me because I want it as well. And the sergeant never ever asked for his crop kitty. <laughs> so when we had to come back, now you aren't allowed to bring stuff back um, from the border like that. You, you, they told you you're not allowed to bring anything back. So um, what happened was we. Uh, I took all my clothes out of my balsack and I packed everything. I put this in the middle and I packed everything around it, around it, around it. And um, ah, I got it through. I don't know if they didn't x-ray my stuff or what, but I got it through and it's with me today, 40 odd years later. And um, yeah, it was, that's one of the things I've got. Then um, the other one I've got is this Avambu knife. Uh, it's made from a um, from a file, a, a, a metal file, apparently. And um, that knife, I didn't. I uh, it was a very funny story. I can't remember if I got it this this time when we flew back, or the next time. Uh, but anyway, when we got to the airport, um, the guys. Uh, we saw that they were actually searching the people. And the one guy took this out of his ball sack and he said, he's scared they're going to they're gonna nail him. And he went and threw it in the dustbin. And I thought, nah, uh -uh, you can't. You've taken it away from, from, the, from the Ovambu people, this person. And now you're throwing it away. You can't do that. You just can't. And I went and I dug it out and I stuck it in my sock, in my boot and my sock. And I went and sat, because there was a, um, they call it movements, where you go through the, through to the aeroplane side, and there's a fence. And I went and sat, the grass was about maybe six, eight inches long. And I went and sat there and had a smoke away from the other guys. And I took this thing and I pushed it through the, through the fence into the other side. And because um, what, because the guys were then coming, going through and then standing on that side of the fence. Uh, very near to where I was sitting. And when I finished my smoke, it was just about our turn to go through, and we went through, 
And I went and sat up against the fence and had another smoker stuck it in my shoe boot again. So that's how I got that one out. I think I'm a good smuggler. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so that's that one. So I've got that knife as well from the border. And um, yeah, my, I actually got it back from my son because he is knife and gun crazy. He, he, he would have loved to have gone and joined special forces or something like that. But he's a diabetic, so um, uh, he wouldn't have made the medicals and stuff because he's he's got to have that insulin all the time, you know. So he's he was very disappointed that he couldn't go to the army, even if it was maybe overseas somewhere or something like that. Um, then the other thing I wanted to say was I was listening to to um, SV again last night and talking about how much he was carrying. And I listen to the stuff often. I love it. The stories. That, you miss something and you hear something else and stuff like that. I, I listened to some of them twice, three times. And he was telling how um, heavy they used to carry the kit. And, you know, carrying the mag, um, that light, light uh, machine gun, uh, you, the, the, I think it's, I can't remember, I think it's 1,500 rounds as first line ammunition in the belts. And then I used to carry the mag with a 50-round belt to already loaded. And then in my ammo pouches, I had 50-round um, uh, belts. And then my, my uh, Bren 2 carried also some of the ammunition, but plus his. But he had we had he had one of those petroli suckies, those little, those little sock suckies. Then he um he'd, he'd lay the belt in that, and that he'd carry on his back. And um and then our one one liner, um, Lance Corporal, he'd also carry some of the ammunition. But to get back to when we were doing patrols, for example, in, in, in Zambia, I think I mentioned that we it was eight day patrols and we 16 water bottles that's 16 kilograms just in water you carry, you know. Then you've still got all your ammunition and you've got your um, your rats for. For for um for eight days or seven and a half days, whatever it is, and yeah, it, it's that kit gets heavy. Eh? How we how we ever survived walking all those kilometers? I don't know. Um, the other thing I've also forgot about at Okotopi was um, just north of Okotopi, a couple of kilometers north of Okotopi, there was a a watering hole where the um, sappers. Uh, purified the water for the base and they had these big S tanks and then they pump water out of the, the hole and put flocculant in it and all the chemicals and everything would settle at the bottom and then um, you'd uh, then they'd pump their clean water into the water tankers and often it would go to, to the base but that was um, after Van der Mesh had been taken. He was Mr. Sapper, if I remember correctly. And he'd also been taken at one of the water holes, if I, the story goes. I'm not 100% sure. But these guys, they were adamant that we had to guard them. They, they were very, um, because it was after Van der Mesh had been taken by Swapa. And they just, they were, they were shit scared. <laughs> really, they were. But what, the thing that we did there was that they built and they put an S tank up and cleaned the water. And then pumped the sediment out. And so the water was clean. And we used that as a swimming pool. <laughs> so it was like a day in the summer in the swimming pool. But the thing I wanted to say was, on the, I forget what the model of the radio was. It was on the small ones. We were sitting at the gate. And we actually picked up a woman in um, America with a bounce, with a bounce of the waves, or whatever they call it. Um, and she was in. Um, uh, Atlanta, I think, if I remember correctly. I can't remember. But she, we spoke to her for about 10, 15 minutes. And she was on a CB radio. And we spoke to her. And we tried for days afterwards trying to get that bounce back again. But we couldn't, we couldn't pick anybody up. We listened to all the different channels. But we couldn't pick anything up. Then um, a weird thing happened. Uh, 
And I also can't remember if it, oh no, it was, it was at the other, um, at the other base. Um, okay, so then we flew back from Okotopi and we had pass. But just before we went on pass, we were told that um, we were five platoons in the company. We were told that three platoons needed to go to Luata Battle School and two platoons needed to go to um, uh, Durban because it was the, uh, what, the 20, oh, must be 20th anniversary of the country Republic Day because uh, it was 81. And um, we had to, they had, the two platoons going to Durban had to break down all the tents they had used for all those, that tattoo that they had in Durban. I think it was, it was end of May, 81. And um, so we came back from pass and now we wanted to know from our sergeant, who, who's going where, who's going where? He said, no, they haven't decided yet. That's only happening tonight because the other sergeants were also away on pass. So what apparently they did was they couldn't decide which platoons needed to go to Luatla and which platoons would go to Durban. So they, they actually drew straws. They broke two matches in half and they held the matches and the sergeants had to draw a match. And the guys, um, our sergeant drew one of the short straws and we went to Durban. Of course, we were there for, I can't remember how long, two, three weeks. And it was a job. We got on the training potch and off we went to Durban. And uh, the other guys were all pissed off with us. They got in their vehicles and off they went to Luatla and did um, conventional warfare there at Luatla, digging trenches and eating out of fat pana and stuff like that. They were not happy. Anyway, so we went off to Durban and we got there on a Sunday afternoon. And we walk around and we get um, called together. And the, 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 the RSM of the base is going to chat to us now. He first of all says, all in English, of course, because it's, ho it's a hotel command. It's not Mattel command, it's hotel command. And he says to us, what are you guys doing here? I don't want to see anybody in my base on a Sunday afternoon. Go to the beach or do something, but get out of my base. <laughs> so now we've got just dumped our kit in, in, in the bungalow we were assigned to. PT shorts on, army brown towel, and off we went to the beach. <laughs> so we had to be back for supper at about five, six o'clock, I can't remember. And then while we were eating, he came in and he welcomed us all there. And he said, look, guys, we only work from 8 o'clock till 4 o'clock yeah, in this, in this base. Um, as long as you're on parade at 8 o'clock and you work till 4 o'clock, I don't care what you do. You can go to town. You can just, as long as you report at 8 o'clock to knock those tents down, I'm happy. I mean, I couldn't believe this. Eh? So that evening already. We were out and into Durban. And we walk all the way down to West Street and Smith Street and whatever those streets' names are, and, or were then. And uh, yes, we're investigating this place. So the guy said, well, we better buy civvies, you know, because we can't walk around or go anywhere in army uniform. So we went into one of these little shops. And I remember, Chris, it's so embarrassing today to think about it. I bought a cream pants, long pants. Uh, yeah. I can't believe I ever did that, but anyway, it was the disco era. And um, so we, um, we were allowed out every night. We didn't have to stand guard, anything like that. And we spent most of our time going from this at night, going from disco to disco to disco. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the songs that were a hit at that stage was Phil Collins uh, in the air tonight. And ah, it was great. But anyway, um, but another funny thing was when we got back one day, it might have been the Sunday evening or this Monday off evening, when we got back to, um, to the base, one of the guys was using the tiki box 
and he came from the Macquilland. And I have to say it in Afrikaans because it doesn't, doesn't make sense in English. And all we heard him was say, Ma, Ma, ek kan nie glo nie. Ek het trappe gesien wat beweeg. Dit is een escalator. Hy, hy, Ma, Ma, so nie glo nie. Ma, jy sta nie te rupie trap, en wacht jy bykie dan sy jylk boor. Like, we couldn't believe that this act in 18 years old, he had never ever seen an escalator in his life before. And it just shows you the diverse cultures and, and, and whatever it is that the army threw together, you know, people that, that, that have seen such a little or, or experienced life or very little experience of life. And then they with these people, oh, escalator, you see them every day, you know, nothing. And, um, but that was one of the funny things there. But anyway, we spent a fantastic time in Durban. Um, the one night we went to a disco and the guy who took us there, because it was in Durban North, he got involved with the girl and he disappeared and we couldn't find him to take us back. So now we've got a couple of cents with us. So we, there's a taxi outside. So we say to the taxi, we've got 15 rand between the four of us. How far could we go for 15 rand? We need to get back to the telecom on. So the guy says, okay, I'll drive until the 15 rand is up. <laughs> and he loaded us off at City Hall in Durban. And then we trudged all the way back from there. But we were not exactly sober, I can tell you that. And um, we used to go every evening on the way back. There was a little cafe in West Street, I think it's West Street, um, called Mykonos. And we used to go and buy a special samosa and uh, um, one of those milky um, ste uh, steady stumpies. And um, what the guy used to did was he, he'd take the samosa and then just crack the, the pastry and then he'd pour a bit of chili inside it. Yes, this thing's hot. <laughs> it burnt going in and it burnt coming out. But anyway, and you needed the milk to cool it down. With. And the one, anyway, so we were walking back to Hotel Command and one of the guys, I can't remember if it was Graham or, or Nigel, who got lost on the way back. And uh, when we got back to, to our bungalow, he was, he was nowhere to be found. We didn't, we'd lost him along the way there. So we didn't think much more about it because we, was, we weren't exactly sober. And we dived into bed. And the next morning he was there. And he says, guys, I got so lost. You guys just disappeared. And I was in this Chinese garden. <laughs> And I couldn't find the way out. Apparently, there along the bluff, there's like gardens and stuff with these pagodas and stuff. And he got lost in that garden. He couldn't find the way out. He says eventually he found the way out. He, he, he walked along the beach eventually to find his way back to, to the camp. It was funny. Yeah, we laughed. Anyway, so then that when we finished that, um, oh, yeah, we... We had, every day we broke down tents, these um, 16 by 16. I think they're 16 by 16. There were one or two, the double one, the 16 by 32. But um, <laughs> those, <laughs> those, <laughs> those troops that were there were naughty, I can tell you that. Because we found, obviously, where the girls, the girls from George tents were. And there was stuff there, unmentionable stuff that was found in those tents when we had to break them down. <laughs> I won't say anything else about that. <laughs> but anyway, um, they were, I don't know how many tents there were. They were, ah. But anyway, broke these tents down. We had to put them in, um, in the, those square box with, um, containers, but the small containers. How the trucks picked those things up, because they must have weighed tons with those tents in and poles and stuff. Anyway, so when we were finished that, we were put back on the train and we went back to Poch. And when we got back to Poch, we heard the other guys had come back from Luatla. They were allowed to wash their clothes. And basically, before those clothes were dry, they were back on the vehicles going to, the, to Watercliff to go back up to the border. So we spent a couple of days in Poch, uh, three side base. It wasn't long, maybe two, three days. And then our turn was to go and meet them. 
uh, up on the border. And we flew up and we landed in um, Oshigambu. Uh, now, Oshigambu is just slightly northeast of, um, north east of, of Oshikati. No, uh, on Dangwa. And um, there again, our tasks were um, basically patrols, guarding Echo Tower, and um, I think those were basically the only tasks we had, sweeping the roads and stuff, but that was standard. Um, and, uh, yeah, sweeping the roads. Um, so we went out on patrol, you know, five, six-day patrols, seven-day patrols, uh, that whole area just, you know, keeping pre presence and watching, seeing what we could find and all that type of stuff. And um, I'll tell this story now because I think that's when it happened. While on patrol, um, one of the guys uh, was actually the one guy that wanted to always, that in, at three side base, I think it was him, um, that wanted to, to beat me up for some reason. Um, he walked past this old OC, this old lady now, old Uvambu lady. And um, she had a knopki, she had a walking stick. Um, you can see it's very, uh, it, it's from a root. Uh, you can see it's quite long. Um, she had this thing and he took it away from her because he wanted it. And we all said to him, don't do that. The poor woman, can, she's so crumb, she needs that stick to walk with. You know? Nah, I, I, he wants it. He's going to take it. And after about two days walking with this thing, he, he decided he didn't want it anymore. Can you believe it? How people can be, eh? And um, he, I, he asked, who wants this thing? And everybody said, no, well, you took it from the like, woman. You keep it. She said, no, I'm going to back away. I'm going to throw it away. I said, yes, but you're a bastard, man. So, um, so then I took it because you, you can't take it back to the woman. You don't, it's miles from me. And um, that I also smuggled out in my middle of my balsa with all my clothes around. Anyway, um, now we, uh, there's a few stories about Echo Tower. We were at Echo Tower quite often um, for about a week, week and a half, if I remember correctly. And Echo Tower is on the road where the road, the tar road goes from um, uh, Ondangwa to Oshikati, just outside of Ondangwa, there's a, there was a dirt road that went straight north. And along that road, all the towers are. Hey, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Ch Foxtrot, Radio, I don't know how many there are. But we, our, our one we, we, we were assigned to was Echo Tower. It's this huge water tower with a big um, a reservoir. And then a pump station with like a little, well, storeroom, office. The loots and the, and the sergeants used it as their bungalows. And then there were a couple of tents inside the, inside the, um, inside the fence. Kitty, go away. And <clears throat> um, so we had to, th there were two guys always on top of the tower standing guard. Uh, two hours off, two hours on type of thing. And then there were two guys that stood on the on the on the res reservoir of dam that were also there just to keep an eye out. And the rest of us just lay in the sun and got brown. Um, and uh, one night, now you must know walking up those steps that tower makes a hell of a noise. And one night, the loot crept up these steps and he found the guys upstairs sleeping. So I said, fine, you sleep. Your friends are going, your mic is going to Four guys on the tower, four guys on the dam, 24 hours a day. And... Um, Two hours on, two hours, uh, four hours off, or something like that. And 
of course, the guys were very upset because now, you know, it's hardly any time to relax because you're standing guard either on the tower or on the dam. I mean. And um, uh, those guys that he caught sleeping also, they ran till they were very fit. <laughs> and the one afternoon, um, myself and Saul and Pine were standing guard on. Um, we were on the on the reservoir. Late afternoon, must have been at four o'clock, five o'clock. Uh, might have been a bit earlier. And the guys were playing softball in front of us. And Saul was sitting on that side of the dam, reading on the reservoir, reading his book. And Pine and I were standing watching the guys play softball. And the lieutenant looks up at me and he said, "Draper, don't stand here. Go stand over there." So I said, "But." Why? What's wrong? I'm standing up here. So you know, this is the same loot that said um, that in the Caprivi that uh, I only found Khan's Fatashni. So we, we still haven't seen eye to eye with us. Up there. And um, anyway, so I said, man, man, do what I say. Go stand on the other side. Do what I say. Go stand on the other side of the dam. You don't have to stand and watch us. So I said, okay. So as I turned around and walked away, I heard him mumble something. So I turned around and said, excuse me, right now, what's it right now? And I said, man, go stand on the other side of the stand on the other side of the dam. So I said, yes, right. And when, we, when our time was over, I went down and I said to the guys, what did he say when, when, when he mumbled something there? The one I said, he said, I can your donor He's going to black some me before I claw out. So I said, yes, right. I can come. So now it's time for me to go shower. And outside, the, just through the fence, there was one of those pipes that they filled the water trucks with. And we used that as a shower. And uh, so as I was walking towards the shower, I saw him coming out and walking towards the shower as well. So I respectfully let him go shower. And while he's showering, I said from Lieutenant, obviously in Afrikaans, I said to him, Lieutenant, I hear you want to black some me before I claw out. I said, we can do it now. We can do it now, 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 now. Because I don't like waiting. So he's, and he gives me a mouthful of that. I said, no. You call him call on slan no makar. Let's get this out of our system. Ah, la, 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 la. So I said, no, it's okay. I said, just remember, eh? I've given you the opportunity. And off he went. And I got in the shower, shower, and went back to the tent. Anyway, nothing was ever said about it again. It was all left. But many years later, must have been about maybe four, five years later, I was um, uh, at the, I, I used to work for Land Bank before I retired. I worked for them for 43 years. Can you believe it? I don't know if I mentioned that before. And um, we had to go to the bank every day to go deposit any cash that the farmers paid in and stuff like that. And we're still in Trust Bank and Fox uh, Gus and um, those guys were still around. And I had to go to Trust Bank that day. And I got into the lift to get to Teller, whatever it was. Or it was, I was doing a guarantee, I can't remember. And lo and behold, rules in the lift, this lieutenant. Yes, but butter wouldn't melt in the rook's mouth. Eh? How are you? You know, I shake my hand. I said, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> and you? No, he's fine too. But yeah, you know, people are weird sometimes. they crazy people. Anyway, so the one day, I think the third time we went to Eco Tower, Eco Tower, um, we uh, we were obviously allowed to drink beer. We got our two beers because we had the cold old canteen there and all that type of stuff. And um, we got our two beers and we got those um, canvas holders. You put the mortars in, and we wet that and we put our beers in there to get nice and cold. While we stood guard, 
And um, then when we got back, no, it was, it was before we got back. It was really dark. And um, uh, of course, I don't know if I should mention Oak's name, um, but uh, may his soul rest in peace. Um, what happened was um, he had scaled up. He stolen up, yes, and drunk them as well. And playing tomfoolery in the, in the tent, he had slipped and banged his head and was bleeding very badly. And the medic tried to stop it, and he tried everything he knew how to stop it, but he just couldn't. But it was already getting dark. So the lieutenant, the sergeant, they phoned the, um, the base at, at Ondongwa, and they said, no, they'll send a chopper. And um, the chopper came. It, was one, no, it wasn't the Oryx. It wasn't um, the Puma. Puma chopper came. He's a Puma, eh? I think so. He came in and there was space for him to land between the dam and the tower. But when he came in, his tail rotor just touched the, the barbed wire fence and it was just sparks. And he said, no, it's too small for him to land here. We must, they must bring him, they must Kazavak him to the road, which is about 200 meters away. And they must put him in the chopper there. So the guys, okay, that's fine. And he took off again and the guys loaded him on a stretcher and they opened the gates and they ran down the dirt road to the, to the other dirt road and the chopper landed and um, they loaded him in the chopper and off he went and the guys came back. And we then, a couple of minutes later, our guard duty was over. And we went down to, to the tent and we... Uh, uh, Looked for our beers and our beers were gone. And the guys in the tent were roaring with laughter. And they said, no, Herbie brought extra beers. It must have been your beers that, 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 um, uh, that, that he got. But anyway, he used to play fantastic guitar. He tried to teach me to play guitar, but my fingers, my left hand wants to do what my right hand's doing. My right hand wants to do what my left hand's doing. I can't, don't have that rhythm. And, um, Anyway, so ah, we were the Bluxamine. But now we didn't have any beer to drink. So anyway, we eventually calmed down and got to sleep and whatever. The next morning, we have um, the prayer parade and just to tell us what to do and just do um, chicken parade, pick up all the stuff and so on. And as we started chicken parade, they called us all together again. And the loot said he's got very bad news for us. That chopper that landed last night crashed at Oshikati. And everybody's been killed on that chopper, except for what I heard later, except the pilot. Everybody was, there, was, there were a couple of medics, um, one or two other guys, and Herbie, and the co-pilot. They all died in that. I think there were seven people killed in that, in that chopper accident. What happened was apparently was got a brown out with all the with all the dust. He, he hit the flagpole, and he didn't see the flagpole. That's what I heard. I don't know. I'm sure these guys that know the full story on that, but that's what I heard. So yeah, that was the first. That was our first loss or our first casualty in our platoon. First and only, thank goodness. Um, yeah. So that was very really sad for us, and yeah, to this day. In September, I, I remember old Herbie. He's, uh, I think a lot about him, especially because I, I, I said some bad words about him the night before. It was probably by the time he was dead already, you know what I mean? It's not a, not a nice thing to think about. Um, then, um, <laughs> then we went back to... At one stage, we were back in, in uh, Oshigambu, and um, we had to stand guard. And they made us, they, they'd actually captured presumed Swapu people, guys. And there were three of them. But they, the, the cast they had at Oshigambu was already full. So they couldn't put more people in the, in the prison cast that they had there. 
So they put them in the bunker. But the bunkers must get an opening on the outside so that you can shoot through. And um, they made us stand guard over these guys at night. No torch, eh? No torch. So, um, now there's three guys, they all trussed up, tied up, lying there in the, in the what's his name? And um, now the, the routine was you'd stand guard outside. And then when you, when you, then every couple of minutes you'd go and look and see if they're there. But you've got no torch, so you've got to use your lighter or something to see if they're there. And um, what happened during the night? I don't know. The next morning, those three guys were gone. <laughs> they climbed through the front of the thing and gone. How they got themselves loose, I don't know, but they were gone. And they called us all 10 in that were standing guard. And we all just said, no, when we took over, they were still there. <laughs> and the last time he couldn't say anything. <laughs> he says, he never checked if they were there when he... <laughs> And he, uh, so he got run around the whole freaking day. But they did a follow up and they caught two of them again and they brought them back. But yeah, no. Trooper, let's not start with you. Then um, <laughs> another thing was we, they used to make tapes here in the States of the TV. And then send them up to the border. So you saw stuff that's four, five, six months old or seven months old sometimes on the because they just played the tapes every night. And in the mess hall there um, after dinner, they used to start playing these tapes. And old Nigel, he lives now in, in, in New Zealand, and our um, uh, section leader, Willie, they would silly buggering each other around the whole time and making jokes and chasing each other and and the one minute a nozzle comes hearing through the tent where we're watching TV and Willie's behind him and Nigel's out the other side and when Willie gets to the door and he like stops because now it's dark outside you see and he looks and uh, Nigel's just disappeared he doesn't know where to go which must he go left, right, forward? He can't see Nigel. Nigel's gone. So anyway, as he's about to turn around, he hears this groan. And what he says, he looks down, and yeah, he's a trench. And Nigel had run out of the tent and ducked right. And he died. He'd fallen in this trench. And he had broken his jaw. Yeah? So the medics come and drag him out the trench and they take him to the medic tent and they fix him well, see what they can do. Next morning, he's told he must get all his kit. He's going back to the States to one more. So he got here to one more and they wired his jaw closed. But his 21st birthday was like in that period or just maybe a week or two um, after he broke his jaw. But his mother had already sent him a parcel yeah, for his 21st birthday. And um, when uh, uh, the parcel arrived, but they wouldn't let us take because Nigel's going to be there. So we wrote a letter to Nigel and said, listen, your parcel's at, at the stores, but they won't let, us, won't let us have it. So he wrote us a letter back and said, um, please, uh, Sarge, let the guys in the section have my parcel. I'm here. Back in the States, I'm going to put two months, whatever it is, my jaw's all wired up, um, you know. I, uh, I won't be coming out. Rest and recuperation leave at the moment. So anyway, so the Sarge comes, he says, hey, Nigel says you can, have, you can have his parcel. We opened that parcel up. It's a bottle of whiskey, <laughs> a bottle of brandy, and a bottle of cane or something like vodka or something like that. Needless to say, we went and bought some Cokes and we had a party and all the cookies and things were finished within a couple of hours. What a job. And um, yeah, then Nigel uh, joined us again just before we flew back to the States. 
Um, but yeah, that was, uh, but as I say, a lot of uh, road, um, sweeping the roads in that area for mines and stuff like that. Then we did another ops. Um, I can't remember, because I've looked on the map, it's far from, from where uh, Oshigambo is to where we ended. And I don't think we could have walked that distance in a day. So I think what happened was they took us out with vehicles and then dropped us off one by one every couple of meters, you know. Um, but it was a long line of South African army guys um, sweeping through the bush. And um, as I said, the, the, being a troop, you get told very little, just get told to do stuff. And you do it because somebody knows what they're doing or you hope somebody knows what they're doing somewhere. And we did this sweep through the bush. And um, suddenly we look up and yeah, noddy cars, also spaced every 50 meters apart, were like stopper groups. And they said to us, no, they haven't seen anything yet, so we must just carry on. And uh, we carried on, and eventually we ended up, I forget the name of the base, but it's right it's where Echo, to Echo Tower is and all those towers, those water towers. It's right at the top there, very close to the cut line. I've forgotten the name of the base. And um, they said that, okay, got us all together again in the base. We marched into the base and um, that type of thing. And then they said, okay, um, because our drivers are still down that side, they're going to take us with vehicles down to Ondangwa. And then our drivers will pick us up there. And um, so I think it was seven side drivers that took us back. But on that dirt road, we realized something's wrong with this before. Something's not, it kept on swaying, you know, and we strapped up immediately. We, oof. and as we went, because it, um, you get off the tar, off the dirt road, onto the tar road at Dongdangwa, and it wasn't far, a couple of hundred meters was the turn to the left um, into the uh, base at Dongdangwa. And uh, we're sitting there nice, Casually, as we went onto the tar, that vehicle went, you know, yes, I've never been in a buffle that does this. And as the guy got to the, the gate of the army base in, in Ondongwa, to, he, to, he had to turn left. Um, I don't know if he was going too fast or what it was. But as he turned, that buffle rolled. But the, our medic, Obela, felt he had seen yeah, the base, so he'd undone his straps already. And of course, as that thing rolled, he was thrown out. Yeah, we're hanging like bloody bats <laughs> in this buffle, you know, lying on its side. The guy's rifle barrels were all bent. I had the LMG. I don't know. My LMG was fine. I don't know if I hugged it to me or what, but it was fine. Um, the, the other guy's barrels were all bent from, from the roll. And... Um, Bailefeld fell out. He was thrown out. And he says when he hit the ground, he started leopard crawling immediately just to get away. And that, that vehicle stopped about a meter away from him. Can you believe it? Um, and that just shows you, do your drills. You, you drill to buckle up in a vehicle till it stops. Even your civic car, use your safety belt. You know what I mean? Um, anything can happen. And... Uh, Oh, Bailefeld said, as he hit the ground, he just never crawled to get away from that vehicle coming at him. And um, anyway, so then we got um, into the, of course, then there were rank from, I don't know what, how high to how low, came running out of the base to see what had happened and all that type of stuff. And we were sitting there and you know, shocked and stunned. But luckily, nobody was injured or anything. There was no injuries or anything like that. Um, then our driver came to fetch us. And he also, when he got in the vehicle, he said, no, because he had swapped. There was something wrong with his vehicle, so he had swapped it out for another one. And when he, we got into the Toro, this thing also started rocking. He said, no. And he turned around and he went back and he changed it again and then we went in another vehicle. Um, so then we eventually got back to Oshigambu. Um, then um, 
that that took us very close to must have been uh, early late September, early October, and we flew back to the states, where we also had a very short pass, not long, a couple of days, um, and we were back in the base. And we thought, well, it's October, November, December. We're going to fly out. They're not going to send us back to the border now. They're going to just let us sit here and bulbock. And, um, but no, we sat there a couple of days, and everybody was um, uh, uh, just sitting, relaxing, and. We were watching TV and live TV because they up on the board you just saw tapes. And uh, not, no serious guard duty or inspections or anything like that. I think the sergeants and the loots knew we would never stay in inspection again. When suddenly they said, no, nah, we're going back to the border. He said, but we've only got like a month and a half left. What, you know, or the most, the month and three quarters. So, no, nah, they're going back to the border. So back to Watercliff, back on the Flossie, back to Ondangwa. And um, the guys always talk about it, but I forgot to mention it was um, in my stories, is that when you get to Ondangwa, you're high up, and they come spiraling down like that to get that. Oh, it's actually, I love it. I, as I say, one of my um, bucket list items is to ride the greatest roller coasters of the world. And um, I love that type of thing. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, anyway, so we got to Ondangwa and they tell us, wait here. So we wait. 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, nothing. And we're waiting. Eventually they clear us all on and they march us out of the, the Air Force Base and they take us to the felt just outside the Air Force Base and say, find a place there and put us out and put your bivvy up. You're sleeping here tonight. What? Where are we going? No, we don't know where we're going. <laughs> so, um, so we stayed in that temporary base outside the in Bivies, outside the the the, 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 the Ondangwa Air Force Base for I don't know two three two three days, doing nothing. And the next thing they said, no, they found us a, a place to go. We must go. Um, up Ruakana way, uh, Kokofeld. So um, we got back on the airplane and we flew to Ruakana. And uh, uh, we landed at Ruakana and we spent a day and a night there. And the vehicles picked us up. And then they took us south towards um, uh, a, a little town called Apua. Now, Apua is right there in, in, in Kukerfeld, but yes, that place is dry, Chris. It is so dry, it's so dry there, it's unbelievable. And, um, uh, oh, we, we were at the base there at Ruakana. Uh, I don't know what, if, what the name of the base is, but we were allowed to go into the base because we also stayed outside the base in Bivy that night in bivies and stuff that night. But we were allowed to go into the base just to go buy cool drink at the Snoopy and whatever we wanted. And when I got there, um, they had a, uh, if I remember correctly, a, a baboon chained up there. And of course, this thing, if you got too close, it would rush at you, but it couldn't get you because the chain was too short. And I got my heart off the um, But anyway, so at the Snoopy, um, who do I meet there? I meet the, so the, the well, there was then a, the sergeant who I had as a corporal at, um, at one at a uh, school of infantry, a oh, corporal genus. And yes, I said, my draper, what, Mark, what are you doing here? I said, no, we come up here, we don't know where we're going, but we, yeah, and we had a lack of chat. And he says, what happened to you? And told him all the stories. and. That was like a chap, and he, you know, it was just nice to see him again. Some a, a, a friendly face, if you want to say that. And then we, um, as I say, we got on the buffles the next day, 
and off we went down towards to the south towards Apua, and we went around Apua and west into the Cuckoo Felt. Um, and we set up a company base there in um, apparently what had happened was the company commander at the time he had, he'd gone ahead. We didn't know that. They, as I say, they don't tell us anything. They just you're just told to do stuff. And um, he had gone ahead with a few guys and they'd built the camp already, put up the tents for the storeroom and the mess and all that type of stuff, and the kitchens. And we, as we were traveling along the road, we got to this, um, they, uh, the, the, the people that live there are the Himbas, the Bombo Himbas, I think they are. And they're very, still Stone Age type people. It's actually quite interesting. Um, I've got the photographs. I'll send you them and we can put them in where they go. Um, uh, where they still wear loincloth and stuff like that. And the, the, I think it's the married men. They wear a, thing, a hat like on their head. That they never take off. And then they've got this piece of wire stuck up the side that they scratch their head with. Uh, I don't think it's very sanit sanitary underneath that thing too much. But it's actually quite interesting. And um, we were traveling along. We got to this um, few huts and stuff. And there was a windmill with a dam. And then there were, obviously the, the, the dam was uh, overflowing. And then this water was going across the road. And it was the stream of water, maybe you know, about five, six centimeters wide. And then five, six centimeters wide on either, either side of that was grass green. And then everything else was this gray dust. It was actually amazing to see that just that little bit was green on each side. Um, and then we found a base and we went into the base and we were told to go on patrol. And um, the next morning, or whatever it was, that we went on patrol as our full platoon then. Because uh, the whole platoon then worked together, didn't work out in sticks. And we went on patrol up this, um, like a valley. There were two mountains and we were, or very big hills, and we were going up this valley um, patrolling. And uh, we walked and we walked and we walked. The only thing we ever saw were dead animals from uh, zebra some type of buck. Um, you just saw they, bought, they, 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 they just died and there was lack of water, I presume. And their skins were dry, 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 dry. And um, then we walked and we walked and we walked and we got to this place where there was a, um, a Lister pump. It looked new. It was nicely painted green, just like Listers are painted. And... We, the, the farmer types in the platoon, they try to get it started, but they realized there wasn't any, very quickly, there wasn't any diesel in the Lister. And um, so we couldn't pump water. And uh, we um, thought, ah, yeah, they'll give it. We've got enough water, it doesn't really matter. And um, that late afternoon, we heard the squeak, squeak, squeak. Squeak, the guy coming along on his bicycle. So he greets us. We greet him. He says, uh, he said to him, do you live around here? He says, oh, I live just around the corner here. So um, a lot of, you know, language problems. But anyway, we found out he stays just over there. And we said to him, have you got diesel for the pump to make it go? He says, no, he hasn't got diesel, but he can get us some. He'll get us some tomorrow. So we said, no, okay, fine. So early that morning, we're squeak, 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 squeak. Off he goes on his bicycle again. And um, late that afternoon, here he comes back. Squeak, 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 squeak. With a little five-liter tin of diesel. So um, we pour the diesel in, start the list. Yeah, and the water's beautiful, crystal clear. Water gets come out. We wash and we drink and all that type of stuff. And uh, we asked him, where did he go fetch the diesel? No, he went to our base to fetch the diesel. <laughs> he got it from our base. <laughs> so he driven all the way to our base and back again to get five liters of diesel so we can get some water. 
anyway, that patrol finished up and we went back. And um, then we were sitting in base. And I don't know, the corporals or the sergeants, the two sergeants got it in their head. We must, they must get military discipline back into us. And tomorrow morning, everybody must shave. It must be shaven clean. And uh, yes, big commotion amongst the troops. Hey? We haven't got water to drink, but we must shave. So our platoon, our section, naughty buggers, um, we decided we're not going to shave. We'll stick together. And what's the worst they can do to us? We owe money. We know how to jip up. We know how to, 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 to work the system. We are not going to shave. We are going to, we're going to just say, we haven't even got water to drink. How must we shave? So anyway, we go to bed that night in the bivvies. I'll show you the, I've got the photographs of the bivvies we made. And um, uh, the next morning, I wake up and yeah, the guys are all shaving. Got their, got their, their Dixies out and they shave in there. Look see for the yellow blocksoms. See, we, last night, what has changed? No, no, no. They're going to be very cross with us. They're going to make us run or something. We, see, yes, okay. You guys can't stick together for one minute. What's wrong with you? Anyway, so I didn't shave. So we're standing, now we have parade. Uh, sergeant gets us all together and he comes and he looks. He looks at Pine and looks at everybody. And they all shave there. He gets to me and says, Draper, why aren't you shaved? I said, because I haven't got water to drink. Um, the little bit of water I've got, I'm not going to use to shave. So he looks at me and he says, yeah, you'll be shaved tomorrow morning. I said, no, I won't. But you bring me water and I'll shave. So um, I've never heard anything about it again. So all the guys, oh, we shouldn't have shaved either. I said, well, that's what I told you. What's, the, what's he going to do to you? He's going to yark you or he's going to, you know. Anyway, so that was um, uh, uh, that um, where we had to shave. But, oh, yeah, there's one other story I wanted to tell you um, about when we were at Oshigambu and Echo Tower. And I forgot completely about it. Um, the Sarge, obviously, he's in charge of all the rations and all that type of stuff. That's his job. And um, uh, he realized that some of the rations were disappearing. And he couldn't work this out because, you know, who would steal the rations? What would happen? Because we were really, as I said, the last, we were like on not starvation rations, but we were always hungry. You know what I mean? It's, it's rat packs. You can only eat so much rat packs. Eh? And then they had this, this, um, dehydrated vegetables that you put in the world in the water and it was very nourishing and that type of stuff but it, how long can you eat that stuff and um, then he caught that the loot and one of the troops that was his buddy they were stealing the rations and they're eating at one side and of course the sergeant made the sergeant was the murin with the loot eh? the same loot they wanted to block some um and he phoned uh, on the radio to the base and he told them the story. Uh, next thing, this loot was gone. And um, we got another loot. Also, what a gentleman. I, he was such a gentleman, I can't remember his name. He never, you know, he was never, um, he was never in your face. And this is the same loot that was with us here in, in um, uh, Kokofeld. And also, really great gentleman. Um, then, um, we moved camp. And um, the captain said, no, he's been out on a recce, and he's found this nice place. There's a nice dry river bed. And you just kick the sand, and it's damp. The water must be there. Um, don't worry, there's going to be water. Because there wasn't much water where we were. So they keep on driving water in the whole time. So they say, we'll, we'll find, there's a place there, and you just, you just kick the sand a little bit, and the, 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 it's very damp, the water must be there. 
Okay, so off we go. And that morning that they were moving camp, we started a patrol. And um, we started walking in, I think, the, all the mountains there have different animal names, if I remember correctly. And the one mountain there is called, uh, it's more German, it's something like Giraffenberger or something like that. Uh, it's not uh, uh, it's not Afrikaans, but it's Giraffenberger. And um, and we were in that area. And uh, we walked out, we got on patrol and we walked out. And um, it must have been middle of the day. Um, we went, found a place to rest amongst the trees and that type of stuff. And the Sarge said to the guys, let's dig for water. Yeah, see if we can find some water. And the guys started digging. Eh? And old um, uh, signaler Weinemann, he gets his aerial up in the, his Skanestraat up in the tree, and he's on the phone to head office. Uh, he can't get, batteries are dead. Can't get any signal. So he goes to the Sarge, he says, I've tested all these batteries when on the charger and the lights were green. And none of them work. So I don't know. So um, the Sarge comes, he says, he wants, he wants three volunteers, you, you, and you. And I happen to be one. Um, we've got to go back to the base, which is just down the river, not far. And we've got to get um, new batteries. So Vaderman, myself, I think Pine, and there was another guy, four of us. We were just webbing, uh, just a couple of ammunition pouches, rifle, and off we went. Because I didn't have a, a mag in Kukafelt. They never issued us mags, just had my rifle. And off we went. And um, <clears throat> we got to the base. Yes, and this captain's upset. Eh? What, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? No, the batteries we've got are useless. Um, we need to swap them out. And um, uh, we'll be, we're going back then. So he said, okay. And as we came, as we were leaving, a buffle came in just to drop something off. And we said to the guy, can you give us a lift just down the road? So he said, yeah, no, he doesn't mind giving us a lift. And the captain said, ah, you, you, you guys must walk back. You're not getting a lift on the vehicle. You must walk back. So we looked at the bike and what, what's your scene? So, he, so the driver said, I'll go around the corner. I'll pick you up there. <laughs> so he went around the corner. We went through the bush, picked us up. And he took us there, and uh, we made sure all our water bottles were full by the time we got back to base or to the, to the site where the rest of the platoon was. And when, I, when we left, those guys were about thigh depth already in this hole where they had dug, and there was no water. When we got back, they were, th they were in the bottom of the hole digging and throwing the water out above their head. After the, the sand out above there, and there's still no water. So, um, anyway, uh, we were um, just about to leave when um, the radio was now then working, and we got the order that the patrol must be abandoned and we must walk to the certain RV. There is a water pump, a windmill, and a reservoir full of water. Um, so, and we must abandon any other plan. We must get to this water hole as soon as possible. So, and we look on the map, page. Right? It's 18 Ks. 18 Ks is nothing, man. We owe money. We've walked far. We're not worried about 18 Ks. So, anyway, we start walking there in this. Take a paling and off we go to the compass. No GPS, obviously. That's long still time in the coming. So off we walk. Eh? And uh, of course, 10 o'clock that night, we were still walking. So the, and it was full moon. Eh? So the loot stopped us. And he said, okay, let's sleep here tonight. We haven't got, it can't be that much further to go. We've walked now for three hours, four hours. And it must be just on the other side of the hill, but let's sleep here tonight. So we said, okay, that's fine. So we slept there, but we were muhe. We were tired. I remember just taking, I didn't even take my sleeping bag out. I just sat with up against the rock 
with my LMG on across my chest and I just closed my eyes and I, I was gone. And we slept through the night and um, the next morning we all got up, made some coffee with the last bit of water we had and stuff like that. Because the we just, yeah, by the, the thing, man, it can't be far. And we walk over this hill down into a riverbed. And we stop again for a rest. And the guys then made some you know, cool drink with the red pack stuff, drink that. And um, I had about a half a water bottle left. And the other guys had just about no water left. Another guy had a full water bottle and that type of stuff. But there was very little water left in the platoon. And the guys are bitching and moaning. They're thirsty. They want water now. And the loot said to them, he says, guys, I know we're struggling here, but I need you to get to the top of this hill by 12 o'clock. And then we'll make another plan. But we need to be at the top of this hill, all of us, by 12 o'clock. Chris, and now we trudge up this hill. Eh? All the little, the, the, the animal paths, we walk up this hill. Eh? Up, we get up this hill. Zigzagging up this hill. And um, we get to, the, and I got to the top maybe fifth or sixth. Um, the loot was already at the top, and there were a few other troops. And the sergeant, he was keeping, he was at the back. He was keeping the guys going. And when our section got together, we built, there were, there's almost no trees in a cocoa felt. It's just these dry sticks that stick up out of the ground. And um, we tied a bivy to the, the four corners of a bivy to these sticks. And we got underneath this and then we tied another bivy above that. So that you got double shade type of thing. And we sat under that thing, talking nonsense and, and, and God's punishing us now because of stuff we did when we were children and all that type of stuff. You know, it, weird stories come out for us, weird things. And um, <clears throat> Nigel says he's got a little bit of water. I think it was Nigel. Now, remember, we're all smoking, eh? Smoking flat out. All we're doing is smoking. And uh, uh, we're trying to send smoke signals, I think. But anyway, <laughs> so Nigel says he's got a bit of water. And Pine says, well, I'll tell you what we do. You pour a doppy water. I'll wash my mouth out, spit it back. Then Fur can wash his mouth out and spit it back, and then you can drink it. I said, I'm out of that one. I'd rather die. I won't do that. I'd rather die. Anyway, they did that. And I don't know. I just looked away. I couldn't stomach that idea. So, um, and so they continued doing that for a couple of hours. I don't know. But at some point in time, we hear this guy retching here behind us saying, Man, this man is as sick as a dog. So we go and we look. We say, what did you do? Well, well, what's wrong? He says, no, he's so thirsty. He peed in his fire bucket. And then he tried to make coffee with it. And he says, no, he couldn't drink that stuff. But it was vile. But you must know, it's, it's total concentration of, of salts. It's, 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 it's Man, it's, it's golden yellow. It's, it's, oh, disgusting. Anyway, then our little signaler, we can't find him. So the guys are now looking for him. No, we saw him here a few minutes ago. No, we saw him here. We saw, we saw him walk that way. Yeah, we find him. There was like a little cave. No, cave is a really strong word. A little hollowed out in the, in, and yeah, he's sitting in the shade. And he said, now, nah, this is where they must find his body. He's going to die. Yeah, he's not going anywhere. And um, but we said, no, 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 no. And we found a doppy water for him and gave him a doppy water and revived him a bit. Oh, wait a minute. Then at about, it must have been about one o'clock before all this other stuff happened. Now, don't drink water when I'm telling this story. <laughs> And uh, uh, it must have been about one o'clock. The loot says he wants, a soup, he wants three guys to go with him. 
and we're going to go, he's going to go and get water and come back and fetch us. He's going to walk to the water hole, fill these up with water, and come back and fetch us, and he'll take us to the, they all have water, and then he'll take us back to the water hole. So we thought, no, okay, good. And he said, the three guys said, okay, I'll go with him. And they walked down the hill, and we watched them walk down the hill into the valley, and then suddenly they, they just disappeared into the bush. Well, not really bush, it's, as I say, it's Kukufeld. And um, anyway, they disappeared, and five o'clock, half well, past five, they weren't back yet. So the sergeant says, okay, now we have to go look for the loot. The rest of us must go look for him. Ah, grumble, grumble, grumble. We're dying on this hill here. We're not going anywhere. So he eventually convinced us, pack up all our stuff, and off we went down the hill. And as we got to the bottom of the hill, it's getting, it's getting late, but it's not dark, and it's not last night. Um, the one guy says, Sir Sam, Sir Sergeant, Sergeant, I see something shining over there. And of course, the whole platoon stop. And we look. Ah, crazy. You, you're seeing stuff, man. There's nothing shining in that direction. And off we go again. Now, we're just walking in a bonnel. Eh? We're not walking patrol or anything. We're just walking in a bunch. And the guy says, no. They see something again. It's shining. So we all stop again and we look. Nothing. Nah. Don't see anything glinting or anything like that. And as we started moving off again, another guy says, no. He also saw something shining. And then we stood and we watched. And then we saw it. And we, then we heard it. it was a buffalo coming. He bundu bashing towards us. And the loot got there with, um, there were two loots, him and another loot. And then I think it was three black troops. Um, from the area and um, we uh, the guys were actually hitting each other with a fist to get to that tap at the back of the buffalo to get water eh? I, I, I personally went up to loot I gave him a mursa hug and I said I've never been so happy to see a lieutenant in my life eh? and um, we Eventually, everybody got water and we all revived ourselves and started getting dark by that stage. So then the loot, um, then we all got, a, on the, we all got on the vehicle. Now. I think it was 20 odd guys and their kit on the back of this vehicle. And the guy drove. And uh, uh, cut a long story short, we eventually found this water hole, the dam. It was actually overflowing a bit. And the windmill was turning. And the guys just made tea and coffee. And, you know, just, they just drank water until it came out their ears. But the story behind the story is that when the loot and the three guys went down, down the hill, um, they'd walked about an hour, hour and a half. When they got to this crawl that's not uninhabited, it's, 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 it's not used anymore. It's just the sticks. They would build those, those stick houses or rondalukis, and then they put the, the, the animal skins around it, those people, that the himbas that live there. And um, there was like one side of it that would, they didn't take the skins off. Maybe they were damaged or whatever, I don't know. And these guys had crawled into that shade, and they said to the loot, when you find the water, you can fetch our bodies here. This is where we're going to die. This is you, you, you come and fetch us. He said, No, come with me. He said, No, Lute, we've walked, we cannot walk anymore. We finished. You come and fetch us here in this little hut. That's where our bodies will be when we're dead. Anyway, the loot and this other guy carried on walking. He was not happy to leave them alone, but they just refused. They said they're not moving another meter. And um, he went with this other guy and they walked another about another hour. Oh, I don't know how long. And uh, they got to the bottom of this yield, and this guy said, the loot, he can't anymore. He's finished. I, he just can't walk another step. And the loot spoke to him nicely and said, just, to, just help me get to the top. I need your help to get to the top because I'm also tired. 
but if I've got you with me, you'll give me strength to get to the top. I worked with Oak's head very much on. And of course, this Oak, he lost it a bit. And he said, okay, he's going. And he like walked as fast as he could to the top of the hill. And the loot must have been about 20, 30 meters behind him when this guy got to the top of the hill. And the loot says it was fun, the funniest thing he's ever seen in his life. This guy looked. He could because he was watching him the whole time. He like looked, and he, he like almost couldn't believe his eyes. And he said, "Lieutenant, Lieutenant," and he couldn't get it out. Anything else? Out. He, all he could say was, "Lieutenant, Lieutenant." The Lieutenant says, "What's wrong?" He says, "Lieutenant, Lieutenant." And eventually, he got out. But the water hole was just on the other side of the hill. And of course, then they got to the to the water hole. And they filled up, all the, they drank water, and they filled up all the water bottles, and they were just about to leave when they heard a buffalo approaching. And um, the, the lieutenant said to, to the guy, just, just be calm. Don't do anything. You just be calm. And as the buffalo drove up, the lieutenant cocked his R1, and the, the, he said to the driver, who was a lieutenant as well, he says, I'm commandeering your vehicle now. I've got to go fetch my guys in the bush. And the guy said, no, no problem. You can have it. <laughs> but let me just load the stuff off yeah, that I've got. And he, had lo he loaded off bags of milli meal and bags of, of, of moor coffee and sugar. And I don't know, there were, there were four or five bags of stuff, but these big Hessian bags of stuff. And um, he had two or three black troops with him. And he said to one of the troops, take this lieutenant spur, have a look, yeah? Take this lieutenant spur back. We've got to find his troops. They're in the, in the, in the felt. So the, the tracker ran on the spur, and they found the two guys in the, in the uh, Rondavoki where they were going to die, loaded them on the, gave them water, loaded them on the vehicle, and then came to fetch us. And that's when we saw him with the, every now and then that window was glinting in the sun as he was going over the, the rocks and stuff. So that's how we got to that riverbed. But we weren't the only ones eventually that got there. There were about three or four platoons that ended up at that riverbed. Um, what had happened, the backstory to the backstory, is that platoon one had actually done a mutiny. They refused to walk any further without water. They had gone and sat on the side of the hill and they just said to the root, sorry, we're not moving a step further until we get water. We cannot, we cannot work like this. And he said, well, he's going, and anybody that wants to follow him can follow him. But the rest, they're going to get charged for desertion or whatever the correct term is. And he started walking around. They picked up stones. They actually stoned him. Right? They actually threw stones at that dude. And anyway, then he turned around and he reported it to, to um, the uh, head office. And um, they, that's where they decided, okay, there's problems with all these platoons because they're getting all these reports. There's no water in the area and they must all go to this water point. And there were, as I say, there were about three or four platoons in that area, in that, in that where that water hole was. When we left there, that dam was dry. Basically dry, and it was pumping the whole time. Eh? We spent a few days there because we ran out of cigarettes. Now you know, I always make sure I've got enough cigarettes with me. Now for me to run out of cigarettes, then you must know how bad it is. And but I had my pipe with me, and uh, we went to all the guys slept. They were sleeping in the river bed, and there where their heads were, we cropped, and we found all the stompies. We put that in the pipe. And we smoked that, myself and Nigel and, and uh, Pine. We smoked that. And then we couldn't find any more stompies. So then we tried the moor coffee, but that didn't go down too well. <laughs> Try to smoke moor coffee, but that didn't, that, did, that wasn't lacquer. So then we took the Mapani leaves. We tried that. Uh -uh. That didn't go down well at all. But then we didn't have to try anything more because then the Snoopy came to our, <laughs> came to our, <laughs> our rescue and we could buy cigarettes. Um, but another cigarette story which I forgot to say was 
um, when we were in, uh, now that I think about it, when we were in Caprivi and walking there in Zambia, um, you could sell a bottle of water for a packet of cigarettes. You know, in prison, they talk about uh, cigarettes are currency. Well, in the army, cigarettes are currency as well. <laughs> the guys used to sell a, a bottle of water for a packet of cigarettes while we were doing patrolling in, in, in Zambia. Anyway, um, then, uh, what other story? Oh, yeah, then I got an issue. Uh, I suppose because we were living so dirty, I developed a cyst in my ear, on the back of my ear, yeah. And um, they had to casavac me because this thing was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was painful, man. And they casavac me to the hospital in Apua. And um, I remember driving along this road. I don't know how deep that dust was. Maybe eight, eight inches or 10 inches of dust. This gray, gray dust. And this buffle driving along it. And then this plume behind it for kilometers, you know. It was amazing to see that. Anyway, we got to Apua, and the next morning, there was a there was like a, a small company base at a house just outside of Apua, and that's where we stayed. Um, I don't know what they were doing there or what it was, but that's where I stayed for a couple of days. Then they took me to the hospital, and the doctor launched this, this uh, cyst behind my ear. But you know, of course, what is amazing, that hospital was painted cream. But um, at the clinic, we were obviously a clinic, hospital, whatever it was, all the wall up until window height was, was like brownish, reddish. And we, I worked it out. It's from the, the himba. So they, they smear that, that, that ochre and, and, and stuff on their bodies. And they stand up against the wall. And then it, it was the weirdest thing to see this, all the same height, this brown mark across the wall like that. And, um, yeah, so that was that. Um, then, after my ear was, was, was um, better, I will glance and stuff, I went back to the platoon, and we were withdrawn from that area, and we came, and we did patrols, one or two patrols, um, on, along the power line from Ruakona to, to um, Vintuk, I suppose. And um, we did the, the whole formation, proper formation, through the uh, V formation with the, with the tail ends and um, proper patrols in that area just to see if we could find any spur, you know, and that type of stuff. And while we were walking, yes, we got this, this terrible smell. Oh, it was vile. It was absolutely terrible. And the, the more we went, this way south because we were walking south. The more we went south, the stronger the smell got. It was terrible. And <clears throat> what they do there is where the power line um, uh, pylon is. They they got it straight from the top there. They got an electric fence around it. It's high high voltage, and then they've got a fence around that. Right, so it's to stop anybody trying to blow the pylons up. They've got to, you know, it makes life more difficult for them. There are ways and means, I suppose. But that was, and what had happened was, what it looked like happened was, an elephant had been got through that first fence, and then one well, of those Kukufelt elephants got through that first fence and shocked itself to death on that high voltage power line that was now protecting the pylon. And obviously that had tripped the whole electric, what's his name, until they could get this elephant away or whatever. Or, I don't know, until they get the power going again. And what had happened was, was or we, this was the only thing we could think of, was that um, there were two dead lions in the stomach of this elephant. And what had happened was when they, in, in that process, when they were still getting the power back, and the, these elephants, like these lions, are start eating that elephant, and they were shocked when the power came back, and they were also killed. And it was that that rotting meat, 
those those animals that that smell was oh it was terrible it was oh vile but that was something interesting to see you know um actually i asked um nigel the other day did he not take photographs of and he says no he never because those photographs i've got are from the guy in in, in new zealand and uh, he said no he never took photographs of it so yeah it's it would have been very interesting to see that type of thing um then it wasn't long after that that we then went back to the states uh and flew back and um when we got to watercliff air force base ach, they were we knew we were going to claw out within five or six days so i said to the sergeant i said to him listen um can i phone my dad that he brings my car then I'll drive back to Botch and I've got park my car there and then I can just, I don't have to worry about a lift back after I've cried out and all that type of stuff. And after a long chat and speaking to the loot and the company commander and everybody, they said, all right, you can do that. Because they were still waiting for the vehicles to come from Botch to pick us up. And uh, we got, eventually my dad brought the car and myself and Pine and Graham, uh, I don't know who else, four of us in the car and off we went to Potch. And on the way we stopped and bought hamburgers and all types of stuff to eat. And we got to Potch just after dark. Um, I can't remember how late it was. Yeah, but those Oaks, the other guys only got the early, early morning, eh? Yes. I don't know how long it took for those vehicles to drive from Pretoria to to water from watercliff to to perch but anyway and then we the next couple of days we're giving kit back and clawing out and that type of stuff and we were meant to have a parade uh claw out parade but graham had to fly back to east london and he already purchased his ticket so he asked mark must take me to take me to the airport um and there was another guy as well. I forget his name. My ticket, I've got to be at the airport by 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock or whatever it is. And um, can Mark um, take me? He's got his copy. here. So eventually after a long discussion, yeah, okay, you can go. The three of you can go. So um, we disappeared and um, off we went to... And then I only took him to the airport the next day. <laughs> Um, but I understand that they did have the, 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 the parade so everybody can say goodbye and whatever they do at those parades. And then they called all those guys out from set from platoon one that had, um, mutinied or whatever's the correct term in Kukafelt. And they had to do extra days. Eh? They had to do extra days. I think they did about five or six extra days. They in camp for was their punishment for, for not obeying a, a a command. So yeah, the army got them back in the end. Um, and of course, all the guys that have been to DB uh, for a walling and stuff like that, um, they all uh, had to do their extra days and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that takes me to the end of my army career, uh, my, my my national service. That night, they are that night. Graham, myself, and this other guy, I can't remember his name. We went to Jacqueline's here in Pretoria. <laughs> and did we have a piss up? <laughs> we went and um, parked my car in the street. And uh, then suddenly we had this, this party. And I know it was about 12 o'clock. And I was saying to Graham, we need to get home because you've got a flight to East London tomorrow morning and I've got to take you to the airport early and this and that and the other thing. And uh, that's the last thing I can really remember. But the next thing I remember was a Saturday morning waking up <laughs> in my car in Vermeulen Street. <laughs> and all these people going to Saturday morning work and things like that. You know? And uh, the three of us passed out in the car. Of course, my parents, they didn't know, you know, cell phones, nothing like that in those days. 
They were hysterical. They phoned the police. They phoned the hospitals. They phoned the morgues. They phoned everybody they could think of here yeah, in the middle of the night to find out where we were. And yeah, eight o'clock in the morning, I drive up to the front gate. My mother was hysterical. I don't think that she has still washed me clean after, after all the words she said to me, how inconsiderate I am. And, you know, just got back from the border and now I've been killed in the streets of Pretoria in a motor car accident. And nobody knows where I am. All that stuff. Anyway, so I've got a hell of a hangover. And um, I can't, I shouldn't really be driving with that type of hangover. So my mother gets in the car and she takes the two guys to the airport. But yeah, I, for years afterwards, my mother would say, that night, I almost, I aged 40 years that night. <laughs> I was more worried about you that night than I was worried about you when you were on the border. <laughs> yeah, as I say, Chris, that's the, basically the end of, of, of my national service. And um, I don't know if you want me to go on with, um, I don't know how long we've been talking. <laughs> I have to say to you people here on the internet that uh, I first had to get up to close the doors. Because of the noise, because it's damn hot in Switzerland. You know, it's like that old joke in reverse where people think that Africa can't get cold. And then you get there and you freeze, you, you really understand what is cold. Same with, with, with Switzerland, actually, it can get very warm. And today is 52 degrees, which is like 40, 42 in South Africa, I suppose, any day. Right? So while uh, our liberal friend here was talking, I was uh, having the doors open. And I also have to tell you, when he had uh, that story about, you know, when walking without water and suffering, I, I had some flashbacks of that. I, I even at one stage tried to sock a pebble or something because I read in a cowboy group's books many years ago, you know, this guy would be lost in the desert and he would take his pebble and sock it, and that doesn't work. And then there's, of course, mind over matter, you know, where, no, nah, don't worry about it. You know, let's just, just think about it. It's, it's, no, that doesn't work. And so, so while I was talking, I, I grabbed a bottle of Evian water here, which I have, and I drank it, and that made him uh, make that comment of his. <laughs> Evian, by the way, is just a cross. It's just a cross like Geneva. It's not far away in France. Uh, Evian, Evian Le Pas, uh, in Spaffs. The nice water, actually. But you know what, Mark, I was thinking you know, while you are talking, there's a couple of things, and I'm so glad, actually, that you were telling us these true soldier stories and trippy stories, because that was the actual war, much more than what, you know, most people think. That was what people mostly experienced. And for me, what I recall, which was fantastic to me, is to get back and sit on a damn toilet in privacy, low privacy, and then you... Man, you can flush that toilet two, three times and no one is shouting at you. You can take a shower alone, hello. And uh, you can even bend down to pick up a, a bar of soap if it falls, you know, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and then, of course, the washing. Just the idea that you can use lacquer soap and you can put it in a washing machine and you go and read a book or whatever you do. And this machine just goes and it works. Because I remember we had something, what was it, a Sputnik or something, which we turned. Um, and they were massive. I see now back on the market, but they're small. But I remember them as, as very big things, you know. You could, and do you also recall, someone asked me about that the other day. Of course, you would put your name on all your clothes. Um, and then you had like a little cable, which you would split off right hard, very clear, so that they can't get stolen. Mm. A little bit of a lock. Uh, no one has ever told me about that in the army, but we certainly had that until you yeah. realize your name is on it. Uh, some guys actually cheated. They arrived with, uh, with clothes which were, they got from somewhere, which were already pressed with Jeppel Gatnate. Man, perhaps you can tell us about these things, the Jeppel Gatnate and the uh, locks and uh, the, uh, the life. Uh, we've been talking just to answer you about an hour and 50 minutes already. 50? 50. 50. 50. Yeah, of course, my wife will tell you I can't speak English. She's quite right. 
the funny thing when I was in 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 uh, Elizabeth, and I was speaking to a few guys about legacy, and I said, "Well, you know, I'm not actually a guy to do it. My voice is too deep, um, and I can't speak English." You know, I, and they said, "Yeah, we realized that. Chris. We realized that." <laughs> <laughs> so I just started laughing. But if you can just tell me about these things, and I just want to say a last thing. I've seen these smokers. Yes. And you can see the cigarette in they smoke open miles away in the felt. And since I had a dreaded disease, you know, with C1, which we can't mention the name of the band, my sense of smell has completely disappeared and then came back with the damn vengeance. So I can smell somebody smoking now miles away. So I think there is a reason why the army was so hard upon smoking and where you could smoke and where you could not smoke. But I have never seen, and I want to challenge anybody listening here, I have never seen a smoker share his last cigarette. Never. And if I'm wrong, please come and, come and tell us about it and bring your mate with, 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 an, with, with another guy to actually... Uh, Tell us that you're telling the truth here, because I've never seen it. So anyway, tell me about your, your clothes and the Jopo Ghat Nata and the ironing. Um, yeah, of course, we never, I never did the Jopo Ghat Nata and stuff, but I know the guys did. Um, what they used to do is they used to get that very, very thin um, fishing line, the very, very thin one. And then they used to pull it into the they iron the thing and then pull it as close to that that um, the seam or knot, whatever you'd call it. I don't know what you call it in English. And then they'd melt that um, in. But if you used, um, if the if the fishing line was too thick, it actually used to when it dried, it used to then break and crack. So it wasn't um, uh, it wasn't the ideal thing to do. But I never did that. But we used to. And then we used to make the lines in the back of our shirt. And um, when you were really like, I, I don't know why, but we used to always make three lines in the back of our shirt. I don't know why it was like that, but that was like the fashion thing. And also um, on the Bosut, uh, the bush hat, um, the guys, as, as the other guy said, I've lost the ring now, but... Um, you can see that's where the ring used to go in. Um, uh, this isn't my original bush hat. This is the bush hat I got when I did camps. The, um, my other one, all the stitching on the side here was gone. And I tried to sew it in again by hand and that type of stuff. And, um, but th as I say, this was, this was not my original bush hat that I used up on the border. Um, the washing thing you spent, I forgot about that. We, we only ever had those uh, Sputnik type devices in the Caprivi in Wanella. And, but then the rubber had disappeared. Somebody had, the rubber had perished or whatever. So every time you turned it, the water would slop out. And um, so we'd fill it with water and then turn it 10, 10 20 times and then fill it with water and then turn it. So that you, you get a relatively good exercise doing it. But it used to wash your clothes very, very clean. Otherwise, you just use the fire bucket and you put um, uh, your browns in, your pants and your shirt and your socks, or your socks you do, a, you do by themselves. Um, and you just let it stand overnight in Omo or something like that. And um, then you give it a couple of things and you'd rinse it out and then hang it up. Um, but yeah, um, the, because you were in base up on the border, and you're in the tent when you're doing this, um, and it's so hot up there that stuff gets dry so quickly, and you don't have to iron it. So um, you just hang it over the tent, or there's a line you put it over the line, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, but then your socks, you do the same thing with another fire bucket, and you just let them soak overnight, and then get yeah that water, oh, chocolate brown. I'll tell you, after a, after a night lying in that water. Then <laughs> you mentioned the toilets. Um, in Okotopi, they had a, a trailer that had a number of like 
seats on it, but open. You, the guy's sitting here a meter away from you, and you're both having this number two, you know. And uh, <laughs> I used to go late at night. <laughs> I used to wait till it was three o'clock in the morning. And then go to the ark wood and do it when the other people are watching me. Unless unless I had Japa guts. And um yeah, so that was um that. Um yeah, the, 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 the toilets in three side were quite they were always clean, um unless some idiot um uh just was filthy, he didn't clean the toilet. Um but that was always clean, the water was always cold. The shower water was always cold in three side. Um, we actually there were they were uh, on the one side uh, near the one parade ground. There were new bathrooms, but they were always locked. And we found a way of getting in and actually switching the water off, but the geyser on. So it would we walked. So when the other guys got there, they would oh, there's no water, and. Um, then they would disappear. Then we'd get back and we'd switch the water back on and then the water's out and we could shower. Just hang on a second. That's my wife trying to phone me. Um, uh, and uh, they, um, so then we used to have Pine, myself, and Nigel and Graham and the, the Section 1 guys, we used to, we used to go and, 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 and um, shower, nice warm showers. And the guys come back and say, where'd you get to? No, no, ice cold, ice cold showers, ice cold showers. <laughs> but yeah, that was, um, and then on the border, you just had this, this square area with showers in and you'd walk in and Kalkat and you'd just shower and wash and also cold. Um, I don't think we had warm, I can't remember having warm showers up on the border. Um, we must have, but I can't remember. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, 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 your cleanliness is not very, you know, you, you're not, uh, like you didn't die of some sort of sickness as a miracle. You, you, you're so dirty all the time. I, you know, six, that, that when we were in Kukufeld, I think we worked it out for something like 27 days. We went without bathing. Or showering, or you could, all you could do was wash, you know, wash your hands, wash your face, brush your teeth every now and then. But actually, actually, wash your body was very difficult because there wasn't any water anyway. Um, the there was just a where we were, where we were at that river bed that I was talking about earlier. There, the guys basically there was a trough uh, for the cat for the cattle to drink out of. And they used to get undressed and just bath in that and then slosh it all out, put new water in, and the next I could get in, you know, like a swimming pool. But we never, ever swam in the dam because that was our drinking water. Um, anybody thought about that, they would have been um, taken apart terribly, I think. Um, locking of the washing, we uh, only did that in basics that I can remember. We had a chain and then we used to lock, you know, slip it through the leg through the arm of the shirt, whatever it was, and then the stuff would dry. Because actually, they'd steal, your, they'd steal the stuff off your body, you know what I mean? Um, it was actually quite bad. I've heard a story, there was, uh, I spoke to a guy from the British Army, now I don't know if this is also true in the South African one. But he said, and he was actually in the paratrooper uh, regiment, parachute regiment, and he said whenever the wives would put out a box of Omo on the windowsill, it actually stood for old man out. Which meant, of course, other men in, if you understand what I mean. So he had a problem with the word Omo, it was too funny. But the one thing which we had in the police, which was different, I suppose, is we could, depending on which unit you were, if you really had a problem with a guy and he's not, very dissimilar of you in terms of rank, you could actually challenge him to a boxing match. And then on a Friday afternoon, from the colonel to the major to the late most constable was there. And then you could put on the gloves and you would enter that ring and, uh, you know, settle things man to man. And there were no hardship ever or, or hard feelings. Mm, mm. Um, 
Of course, we were the dirtiest white because you could even imagine. I mean, because you. It, it's the one thing about the police college. It was not at all like the police movies, you know, like uh, Police Academy or whatever like that. It was just brutal. Some people say brutal. I don't think it was that brutal, but it was just basic training for six months. And one of the things you do is, is fighting. Uh, they would always match people in the weirdest ways. I mean, they would take the biggest guy to the, to the, to the smallest guy. And of course, the small guy is quite quick, and the big one, well, if you can actually get him eating, we will you know, into a fight right there. So they were matched. And, and of course, in the main streets, there's no way that you can know who you've got to meet, meet up with. And uh, in my experience, if you get to some drunk party, and the people has been doing a bit of boxing there between themselves. The moment you arrive as a policeman, they all become mates and they attack you. So they keep a little dog. And their wives. And some of these colleagues are quite frisk on this. Yeah. You really learn to enter fight, you know. You walk in and you just smack that guy down and then go for the next one. There's no time to waste. But I was wondering, how good would you say was the platoon's morals? Not that in terms of whatever you saw on with yeah. In terms of the group of a functioning together, I'm not meaning from a woman. You yeah, know. the morale. The morale. That's right. Yeah. Um, when? As a platoon, we were relatively a close guy, uh, guys. We would, um, but we wouldn't mix. Like section one would not mix much with section two or six, and we wouldn't mix much with section three. But We'd be more in our own section. It was that was the unit you were in, as such. And um, but you still had a lot of uh, interaction with the other section two and the section three guys. But uh, for me, uh, I knew everybody at that stage. I knew everybody in the platoon, obviously. I, but today, there's out of the thirty guys, I maybe can remember fifteen names. You know what I mean? Um, for example, I couldn't, the section leader, section leader of section two and three, I have no idea what their names are. I, I don't even know what they look like. You know what I mean? I couldn't, I can't even see their face in front of me. Um, but there's certain guys, that, especially the section three guys who were the naughty guys from Cape Town, the Dacha Um And um, they were really from the wrong side. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't say things like this, but they were from the wrong side of the track, you know. And I think they'd forgive me for saying that if they hear this. Um, because we got on so well, you know, they were always disappearing to go have a, a pipe or something like that. As I said, they used to teach us to do this. And they do it in the bungalow. You know, they sit and watch, you know, what they do. And the best, um, the, 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 when they make those dacha pipes, they used to um, take the dacha and uh, mix it with Lexington cigarettes. Um, and they used to call it the salt, the soap. And then they take that that silver paper um, that they keep, you know, that silver and white paper that's around the cigarettes. Then they'd take that paper and then they'd carefully take the white paper off. And then they'd roll that silver paper in, in, in like maybe a start of one millimeter. And then they'd roll it, roll it, fold it, fold it, fold it, till the whole thing was folded up. Then they'd roll it into a spiral. And that fits exactly into a Coke bottle top once it's rolled like that. And that would be that filter. Then they'd take the Mandrax, for example, because then that's a, what they call a white pipe. They'd take the Mandrax and they'd crush it onto that white paper and mix it with the Lexington cigarette and the Dacha. So the pipe was full. And then they'd push it in there and then they'd light that white piece of paper with a match or a lighter and then light the, 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 the pipe. It's like the broken bottleneck with that. And um, you know, that type of stuff, I've seen them do it in front of me, you know, and, and they get so high on that stuff. Man. It's so unreal. And then they used to find that stuff in, in Novomboland as well. I don't know where they get it from, but then you'd see how oh, Gary's eyes are, um, Gary and Libby's eyes were red again. They, they, they'd found some, somebody had Dacha for them there, whatever it was. And uh, they, as they used to say, oh, 
de Afrikaans is, uh, de Cape Afrikaans, want hulle was op een beter plak gewees. <laughs> you know? Ja, maar ja, um, boxing, boxing was never great, was never big in the army. Um, uh, the last time I did any boxing, I think it was in Senate 7, where a little guy, a pipsqueak guy, beat the living what's the name out of me. Because uh, I've got no, uh, I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Um, uh, I've been in very few fights in my life, thank goodness. Um, but I will defend myself if I have to, you know what I mean? But uh, I don't know how, but I will try. Um, <laughs> now, boxing was never big in the army, um, amongst us anyway. Um, uh, uh, yeah, there was never anything like you say where the guys would attack each other, would, would dare each other and say, okay, Corporal, I'll get you Friday in the ring, type of thing. No, nah, there was nothing like that that I knew of. Was this a drug use? Was it ever a problem in the sense that the guy would then be un unable to function properly as a. No. Nah. No, nah, there was never, as I said, there was only the dacha, and they do it at night, and the next morning they find again. Um, but there was never anybody on that I knew about that was any, on anything serious, more heroin, that type of stuff, I don't know. Um, but it was basically the dacha that the guys were using a lot. But the next morning they'd be okay. They had red eyes and stuff, but they'd be fine. They'd sleep it off during the night. Um, they used to get the munchies. Yes, they used to get, get hungry and they'd just they'd hey, well, go to the cafe and buy some food or something just to, you know, yeah, because they were hungry, always hungry, you know, even because we, even they were hungry before they started that because it was <laughs> never enough food for me anyway. And, um, but as I said, there were never, never much, I can't think of anybody drug addict. We had one guy, um, he was, he bet for the other team. Um, who tried to commit suicide, and that was not a pleasant sight. Um, uh, in the, the they used to, the toilets there in Poch, they used to, or the bathrooms, they used to use the fire uh, hose and just wash everything, you know, with that. And then this water would stand and pull every way. And they'd take the squeegee, but you never get all that water out. And um, where this guy had slit his wrists in the toilet. And it was not a present sight. It was not a present sight, really. Um, but he did survive. Um, the medics got him. They left him there. If you want to die, you can die. Um, we're not interested. But obviously, they did attend to him. And he did turn up a couple of months later again, but he wasn't around long. Um, we did have a few, few of those type of guys around, but they got sorted out very quickly. They were like shipped off. They were never in, in our platoons as such. Um, that I knew about, unless they were, you know, they didn't come out the closet as such. In those times, it was very, you know, it's different now, you know, it's, it's, but that time it was very frowned upon, obviously. Um, but it was, uh, we didn't have anybody in our platoon, I think, that was that way inclined. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask you a, a question which somebody asked me to ask you people, you army people. What's the most feared thing in, in the, for a national serviceman? Is it the RSA or the um, military police? I don't know. Look, I've, I'm a good boy. Basically, I'm a good boy. So I wasn't worried about the police. The RSA was the person I was the most scared of. I, think. <laughs> I had nothing to fear from military police as such because I didn't do anything. I didn't break the law or anything like that. But... Um, yeah, the RSM, I think he was, he, he is the guy to be fear, feared in inverted commas the most. Uh, although we had some great RSMs, they used to teach us a lot, you know, because they'd been years of experience. And um, they were always willing to part with knowledge when we had training and they were on, on the floor. Then they would, like the one guy we had, um, he obviously was a mortarist at some point. And he would teach the guys all the little tricks on the mortars and stuff like that. They the, the mortar guys loved him. Um, they thought he was the bee's knees. And um, but the corporals, they were the guys that the sergeant, the platoon sergeants, corporals, they were the guys that uh, you used to hate those acts, eh? In basics and 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 I think their job is to their job is to make you hate them. 
I remember one time when I was on that section leading course, um, it was early morning, it was middle of winter, early morning, and um, we needed to get to the, to the um, we had standing parade that uh, inspection that morning, and I decided I'm not going to go to, to, um, to breakfast, I'm going to finish the inspection because there's one or two things you've got to sort out. And uh, he caught, caught three of us in the bungalow that had chipped out breakfast. You're not allowed to do that. You had to go to breakfast. And he wanted us to stick our heads in those ice cold fire buckets. And I just refused. I'm not sticking my head in that fire bucket. Um, you can stand on his head and whistle, what's his name, through his, what's his name. But uh, no, I, you know, me, I was out of that a lot of the time. But maybe because I was a little bit older than the other guys. And um, I don't know. It was, I just I wasn't prepared to do stuff, stupid stuff like that. Um, you could make me run up and down as much as you like, but I'm not sticking my head in the middle of it into that fire bucket that's got about half an inch of ice on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> You've got to break the ice to actually stick your head in there. I have to say, I often wondered about these instructors. Never I fully realized that we were actually on the same team and was wearing the same uniform. I remember at my news cop, it's something like the School of Infantry, where you do all your counterinsurgency and riot training and all sorts of other stuff. And uh, <clears throat> they had something there which they called the Chinese push-up. Now, a normal push-up is nice and manly. I mean, you just, you know, you... you if you could do that. Naturally. I mean, as the one sergeant said to us, you can imagine uh, think you're on honeymoon or something and lift it. Okay, I didn't quite understand what he meant, but... I, I got the idea, but the Chinese push-up is something different. You stand with your ass in the air, uh, and on your hands, basically, with your ass here above yourself, and then you stand, and you can think, okay, this isn't uh, not so bad. After a few minutes, it actually does get bad. Yeah. I mean, it's, your body's not designed for that, man. So anyway, this one fellow actually started shooting with his line off, his rolling instructor, and he shot the one constable right in the ass. Well, greatest of, sh of shots. I mean, he just touched him, basically, made a nice burn mark there on his ass. Um, and all hell broke loose, broke loose, of course. Yeah, this, this instructor was immediately arrested for attempted murder, things like that. But, yeah, that was the thing in the police. I, I remember one constable actually decided he's going to have to go back home with a heart on his back, like a heart, you know, for his girlfriend. So he went and he cut the damn heart out of his uniform, this big. And uh, of course, they arrested him right there on the spot for damaging state property. I even, uh, so, so, so they were, I think, different cultures, definitely different cultures mm. between the two. But nothing wrong with you guys. I just want to say, if you're sitting here and you're thinking nice things about your drill sergeant or corporal, man, you need help. You actually have to go and see a psychiatrist because you are suffering from a Stockholm syndrome. It's not natural. You shouldn't like the guy. You can tell me now he was just doing his job. And yeah, perhaps he was, but you don't need to enjoy your job that much. That, that's the other thing I could never quite understand. You know, that is grins on their face. And I remember when we started Legacy, I interviewed quite a few RSNs. And I thought to myself, they're very nice people, but sometimes, I will look at James Tate for even, uh, not even SVA, even SVA for it. And you look at these sergeant majors and all these things, and sometimes they just turn like that. You just see that animal coming out, devil, I was supposed, and then they switch back again to normal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I can quite understand that. But I think we're at the end here now, and I must thank you. Thank you, uh, Mark. And I think I speak on behalf of everybody when I say that Phil Collins' song in the air tonight is stuck in my head and it's going to be stuck in my head for the next few days. And I'll think of you. And I wonder, all of you here, can you let us know, is, is this song now stuck in your head as well? I would have loved to put it on for you here, but, you know, YouTube, if I do that, they will get me with copyright infringement immediately. And so for the rest of you, please come and talk to us. Tell you your story. You are not unimportant. Come and tell your story. Come and join the legacy movement. 
um, go out, get your beret from somewhere, get yourself to the associations, get yourself to the parades, don't sit alone, come back to the fold, come back to us, our brothers in arms, come back, let us talk like the day where we laughed about the old days and joked around, that's what we want to do until we meet again, God bless.